One more time. Let's hear for our worship team. Isn't this wonderful? I love it. I love it. I love it. We've just been leaning into Advent, just a little bit different, and it's enough to kind of awaken the senses. If you're like me, I didn't grow up in traditional church world, so this feels new. This feels different to me, and, and I love that. It's good to awaken our senses to the Lord in a new way. And we're continuing our Advent series. Last week, we talked about hope, the arrival of hope. Again, Advent just means the arrival, so the arrival of hope manifest in the life of Jesus. And today, we are talking about the arrival of love again, manifest in the light of Jesus, so the arrival of love. And as I was going through this, I I told my wife, I said, these big subject sermons are so deceptive. You go, love, easy, right? (laughs) There's so many verses about love, I'll just grab one of those, and the deeper I got into it, just like hope, I was like, oh, good heavens, Lord, (laughs) give me clarity, give me strength, help me to, uh, to, to, to be in touch with you, Holy Spirit, as we talk about love, because it's a big idea, and it's not something that we just, you know, at the end of the sermon, it's not like we just have the definition, and we're all good now, and we get to go home. It's just unpacking one facet of God's love, which is multifaceted. There's thousands of different ways to look at God's love. Um, But for us, in, in our culture, in our context, love is hard. It's hard to talk about. Uh, love in the English language, we only have one word for love, right? which is kind of a problem if we're being honest. Like, I love my kids, right? I love my kids. They were up here, even my son who's not taller than me, I love my kids. And I love tacos. I just love tacos, right? I love my wife, she's wonderful. We've been married for 19 years. I love my wife. And I love the new season of The Crown, it was excellent. You should watch it, it's great. (laughs) We have a problem, right? We only have one word for love, and we, we rely on context and adjectives or anything else that we can to add to it to explain the different layers of our love. And if you've ever read the, the, the Christian classic, The Four Loves by C.S. Lewis, I would recommend that. I mean, C.S. Lewis dives into all the different Greek words for love because there are multiple words in, uh, in our New Testament for, for love, and he unpacks all those in a really beautiful way. But we're limited a little bit by language, right? And we're severely limited by our culture right now. This week, uh, the hashtag love is love was trending. And, um, and we had some, uh, some legislation that was passed uh, trying to redefine the term marriage. And um, as I was praying into it, I, I was looking at, at this week and I thought, I, I really just had an epiphany from the Lord. But marriage is God, God's idea, right? It's not government's idea. Like the government didn't invent church, God did in Genesis chapter 2. And it is this beautiful picture of a man and woman, uh, two equal and unique expressions of God's character, coming together in a sacred, holy, and mysterious union. And it's not just to make them happy, right? It's not just you get married so that you'll be more happy. That is, that is not what marriage is all about. And if you've been married longer than a year, you know that. It's like there are moments that are good and moments that are not so good. But this beautiful mystery of marriage is this, that Paul says that marriage represents the relationship between Jesus and the church. What a crazy thing. And the the government can't redefine that any more than I can grow another inch and try to be taller than my son. I can't do it. I can wear boots. It gives me a little bit of an advantage, but we can't do that, you know? And we've become so confused with this idea of love. And the the hashtag love is love is silly, right? Like that word love has been so devalued and so confused that we can now only define love by itself. We can only say love is love, I guess. I don't know. Our culture has no no idea. And we, we think that love is sexuality. We're really just saying it's just sexuality. It's unmitigated affirmation like you do you, whatever you want to do, no problem. That is not love. We think that love is a feeling, that it's temporary, that it's shifting, that we could fall in and out of love as if it's just this sort of accidental thing. And this is a flimsy and poor foundation for understanding love. Our culture does not get it. They don't understand love because they don't understand God. And we're going to talk about that today. We are trying to build a robust, beautiful picture of this very multifaceted idea we call love. 
So if you've got your Bibles, turn with me to 1 John chapter 4. Uh, we're going to dive into um, 1 John 4, 7. And I'll just say this. If you want a, a real beautiful, complicated, like worthy of study sort of book when it comes to love, 1 John is it. Like I had to, there were so many nuggets that I had to put down. I was like, oh man, I really, I really want to talk about that. I got to set that aside. Like there are so many beautiful, beautiful things in 1 John when it's talking about love. Uh, but we're going to be in uh, 1 John chapter 4, starting in verse 7. And it says this, beloved, let us love one another for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. When I was younger in the Lord, um, <clears throat> I really equated knowledge of God as loving God. And I thought, okay, I became a Christian, and I'm like, I want to serve the Lord, and so what did I do? Dove into deep Bible study. I got those, I don't know if any of you guys ever got those, like, Bible memorization cards that you're like, you get them, and you're like, well, I kind of want to memorize this first, but it's, it's in the list, so I've got to do it, you know? And you're, like, going through the Bible memorization, and, and all of that is good, and all of that is great. None of that is wrong, and especially when you first come to know the Lord, all that is really awesome. But that is not the foundation. When, when John says, and this is bold, he says, anyone who does not love does not know God. It's not knowledge first, it's love first. And love is the proof of the knowledge of God. When, I, uh, when my wife and I were on staff with YWAM, um, we, we had a group of, of young people that we were in charge of discipling. So I had a group of guys, and I would meet with them a couple times a week, and we would sit together, we'd pray for each other, and then I'd meet one-on-one -on -one with them all the time. And one of the guys that was on uh, my team, he was uh, from England, his dad was a pastor, very heady guy, and he started kind of walking away from the Lord. Like, it, later on in his high school years, he started going, well... This is for my dad, but I don't know if it's really for me. And he started walking away from the Lord. And I don't know if this is a good strategy, strategy or not, but his parents were like kind of freaking out about it, so they, they sent him to YWAM to go do missions, <laughs> which I don't know if I would have made that call, but they were like, maybe this will fix you. So they sent him, and I had him on my team. And, um, and I thought, this is fine. Like, I, I left engineering school to go be a missionary, so I was going, I've got kind of that mind, you know, and I was a pretty strong atheist, and then I became a Christian, so I thought, I've done the opposite of him. Like, I've come from this full, like, not believing in God into believing in God, so I thought this is going to be great. So we had all these meetings, and basically every single meeting went like this. He would bring a point, and I would counter his point, and he would bring a point, and I would counter his point. And then we'd finish a meeting after an hour, and, I'm, and I would think, well, I countered some of his points. That's good, you know? And then we would do this, like, a few times a week, every week. And fast forward a couple of months, and I'm starting to get pretty frustrated. Because I'm like, I have great, great points here. You know, like, I have a rock-solid case. I don't understand why this guy is not just going, I'm surrendering to the Lord. Ryan's logic is so locked, you know, locked, locked in. Um, and I remember one time we were talking, and it was really coming to a head. It was like, this, this is what I believe. And he's going, I don't believe that. And we were going back and forth and back and forth. And it's getting more and more emotional and more and more charged. And at some point, I got so frustrated, and I'm not proud of this, I got so frustrated, I just cussed. I just cussed at him. And I was like, and this is not a strategy I would say to implement in your discipleship. Um, I just, I was so frustrated. I was like, from, from head to head here, like, I've got great points, and you're not understanding these points. Like, this should work. And as soon as it happened, I felt like so, you know, like I just felt so bummed out. I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. I don't know what came over me, you know? And when I was younger, what I didn't understand is loving God is a lot more than just knowledge about God, right? We're... Uh, we're a lot more than just brains on a stick. Like, we, we have a lot more to us than what we're thinking. And I think if I were to do it over again, I would have sat with him and said, what's going on with your life? What's happening? You know, instead of going after apologetics, and apologetics is great, instead of trying to convince him that the Bible is the Word of God, I probably would have just built relationship with him. How are you doing? What's going on? What's going on with your family? The kingdom of God is built on that. 
It is love first and then knowledge, not the opposite. Knowledge doesn't save us. It's the love of God that has saved us and brought us through. Jesus, when he was asked, what are the greatest, what's the greatest commandment? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Uh, And he said, the second is like it. So he starts to say, there's this connectedness between these two ideas. They're very close together. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. He said, on this, the entire law and all the prophets hinge on these two ideas. Love is so woven into Jesus's theology. We just can't pull them apart. And notice what Jesus said. This is so interesting. So Jesus doesn't go, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor like you love God. He says what? He says, love your neighbor as you love yourself, right? I think when I was younger in the Lord, I didn't really love myself. And I don't mean love in the sense of the world where you're loving yourself and that means you're affirming everything that you do, good or bad. That is not love. That is not what I'm talking about. I didn't appreciate the uniqueness that God had made me with. I didn't appreciate the price that he paid on the cross for me. I didn't find myself with a whole lot of worth. And a lot of times, the measure of love that you give yourself is the measure of of love that you give to other people. So the measure of grace you give yourself will be an indication of the level of grace you give to other people. And so many times this is clear for other people. This is like the sad state of being a human, right? It's like you could see it in other people where they are so hard on themselves. They're driven. They never let themselves slip on anything. And what do they do for the people around them? They treat them exactly the same way, right? It's like don't let them get by with anything. And that is not the love of God. We have to understand that God loved us. This is the love story that we hear in the Bible, And yes, Christ died for the church. Yes, Christ died for everybody, for the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him would have eternal life. That is beautiful and it's wonderful. But God so loved you that he gave his life for you too. He sees a ton of worth in you. And if you see yourself as worthless, you're gonna treat people around you as worthless. And this is the beauty of the gospel, right? I, I love this. Let's pick it back up. First John, First John 4, uh, verse 10 says this. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, love that word, the propitiation of our sins. This is love. Not that we pursued God, not that we were chasing after an aloof God who was just like moving along and is like, hey, catch up, kid, if you can. That is not the kind of God that we serve. We love God because he first loved us and he gave his only son as a propitiation for our sins. That just means he was satisfied. He satisfied satisfied the wrath of God. He satisfied the judgment of God. We don't have any fear of judgment Because when we follow Jesus, we take his righteousness onto ourselves, the propitiation for our sins. We take something that we didn't earn or deserve or have any right to. And I think for some of us, if we don't understand how dark it was before Jesus, we don't appreciate really what he did. We were in darkness before Jesus. Colossians says you were enemies of God and that you've been conveyed, like you've been plucked up out of the kingdom of darkness, wallowing in the dark, not knowing anything, being so confused about everything, and you get plucked up and you get brought into the kingdom of light where you could see. You could finally see, and the Holy Spirit is there giving you insight. What a beautiful thing. And God so loved you that he wanted that for you, a new kingdom for you and I to enjoy. I'm reading a a, a new book, and I'm I'm almost done with it. It's, It's... really great. I'd really recommend it. It's called You Are What You Love. I can't remember the the name of the author right now, but um, wonderful book. Just so great. And he was talking about the love of God, and he talked a lot about how, hey, we don't think ourselves into the kingdom. We really, we love ourselves in the kingdom. You become what you love. And when you love and you adore, when you worship Jesus, you become more like him. And in, in his book, he's talking about the fact that God loves us first. And 
And First, first John 4, 19 says, we love because he first loved us. And um, he said, the idea is this. One of the most loving relationships that we have in the human experience is between a mother and a baby, right? A baby is born, and the mother instantly falls in love with this baby. Not because they earned it, not because they, they did anything special. The mom just loves this baby unconditionally like that. And every day she holds this baby, and what does she do? She smiles at this baby. She talks to this baby. And if you know anything about babies, they are not able to smile for like the first few weeks, right? Maybe even longer than that. Uh, although every parent would say, oh, my child smiles, but doctors say, really, it's probably because they have gas. That's that face that they're making. Um, but every kid want, or every parent's like, my kid's special, though. They smiled when they were like three days old. You're like, that's not possible. That's okay, though. Um, but babies, they, they watch their mother smile over them every single day, and they don't know how to reciprocate it. And then one day, what does the baby do? The baby smiles. Not because the baby came up with the idea of smiling, not because they've mustered some sort of love for their mom, it's because their mom loved the baby first and taught him or her how to smile, right? This is the same with God. We don't love God because we've memorized all the Bible verses and we've mustered up enough love and we've gone to church, you know, 52 weeks out of the year. All that stuff is good and it's great and it's fine, but it's the fruit of somebody who loves God. It's not the inverse. You're not trying to earn the love of God by doing those things. We love because God loved us first. This is primary. And then the second thing, which is a lot like it, and the love of God has to come into this, it has to spill out into love for one another. Let's skip back a little bit. First John chapter 3. Uh, I'm just going to go out of order just to bother all the OCD people in the room. Uh, First John chapter 3, uh, starting in verse 16, it says this. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need and has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in this person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Uh, my son, uh, Toby, the giant kid that was up here, um, uh, him and I were having a conversation uh, a couple, couple years ago, and he was having, uh, having some trouble with his sisters, had some trouble treating them nicely, which I know is totally unique for, for, uh, for big brothers to treat their sisters not nicely. Um, we were dealing with it. I was like, buddy, come on, you got to be nice to your sisters, you know? And every time he was not nice to his sisters, I just got angry at him, which is super helpful, right? Like, you're mad at your sisters, so now I'm going to get mad at you. Like, I was not teaching him anything. And we just kept going around and around. And I realized, I remember one, one time we were having a conversation and he, him and I were talking and it was just this like wonderful father-son moment. And he said, dad, I love you. And I said, buddy, I love you too, you know? And this thing just clicked in my head and I thought, now is the time. Not when I'm mad or not when he's treating his sisters bad. Now is actually a really good time. And I said, buddy, you know, one really important way that you could show uh, your love to me? And he said, how? I said, show love to your sisters. He said, how does that show you love? And I said, oh, buddy, what you don't understand as a parent is when siblings treat each other with love, that means a lot more to us than you even telling us you love us, right? You're like, I want to see you guys get together. Like, nothing will bring a tear to a parent's eye than seeing their kids, like, playing together, loving each other, being nice, being friends with each other. And I said, buddy, your love for your sisters is an act of love for me. It really does. It extends to me. And for, for, for most, I mean, if you're a parent, you know this. Any of the lectures that you give your kids, we all know. We're like winging like 95% of it. We're just like saying words, hoping something will stick, you know. Occasionally, you say something and you go, that was good. That was good, you know. And, uh, and that was me. I was like, you know, I think that's good. And I thought, you know, this is what a beautiful way to understand loving God and it's spilling out into loving each other. 
I think we kind of separate them, and, and Jesus said, no, they're like, these are linked. They're, they're like, they're, they're two, two sides of the same coin, that you can't separate them. You can't just say, I love God, and I've learned so much about him, but I hate my neighbor. I mean, the, the Bible is full of not-so-nice words about people who do that. Like, we have to love one another. It is the fruit of our love of God, right? It's crucial. But you have to say it, and I love this. It says, if you see a brother and sister or sister in need and you have no pity on them, he says, how can the love of God be in that person? Some of us, I think we've gotten a little too callous toward the pain of other people. Some of us, we need to pray, Lord, restore to me some empathy for other people. Maybe there's some people in your life right now that are really a pain in your backside. Maybe there's some people that are just driving you nuts. Maybe there's some people that were at the Thanksgiving table saying something different, you know, politically than you, and it was really driving you crazy, and you just can't think about it. Or somebody that's making a lot of bad decisions in their life, you're like, I want to fix them. And God is going, no, let your heart break for them. He said, I'll give you some perspective. I'll give you some empathy. And those moments for me, whenever I, I feel that, it's miraculous. Like, I just go, oh, I didn't think about that, you know? I didn't think that they were going through that, you know? And you can't have relationship without closeness. You can't be in somebody's life and not be around them and know what they're going through and ask them about their story, ask them about what's going on with them. So we have to have empathy and love for other people. But then he says this interesting phrase, and I love this. He said, let us not love with words or speech but with actions and in truth. The world tells us that love is affirmation, and it's not. They're two different ideas, right? That if you love me, you'll just affirm everything that I do. And if we're being honest, we know that doesn't work, right? It doesn't work. If you're hurting yourself and somebody around you is like, oh, it's fine, just keep going. That doesn't feel good. That's not love. If you're going through something and you need some correction in life, you need somebody that's empathetic, but that can say, hey, can I tell you something that's true? Can I bring some truth into this love? A lot of times we put truth and love against each other. That's not true at all. They work hand in hand. If you love somebody, you tell them the truth. You do it in the right way and with a bunch of empathy and love and compassion in your heart. It's not something you relish. You don't run to it and go, ha ha, you screwed up, I got you, you know? Like, hey, let's sit down, I wanna tell you. No, it should be something with fear and trembling going, I could mess up just like you. Can I tell you, I just, I wanna tell you, there's this thing I see in your life and I don't think it's great. Can I pray for you? Can I work with you? We all need that. Ultimately, for love to flourish, we need to be vulnerable. We have to be vulnerable. Vulnerability is the currency of love. When we spend vulnerability on each other, we're showing each other we love each other, right? Because vulnerability costs us something. It just costs us something. And Jesus, and I love this, it's the thing, again, that separates us from every other world religion. Jesus came vulnerably as a baby. What is more vulnerable than that? And in the Christmas season, we remember that he came as a baby in great danger with Herod trying to kill him with everything that he's got. And guess what? Jesus was so vulnerable, he even accepted death. And if you think about it, like the cross, this is the most vulnerable body position you could be in, right? Right? Like, none of us are comfortable in this position. If we're tied in this position, this is not comfortable. It's like every, we're just exposed. And this was Jesus. He was so vulnerable. He gave everything for us. He showed us what it means to be vulnerable with one another. And if we're not vulnerable with each other, we're really not showing love. It's that action that Sean's talking about, action and truth. It's not just talking about it but living it out. And this morning, we're going to live it out just a little bit. Um, 
if you're going through something difficult, if, if you have physical ailments that are really painful, if you have emotional ailments that are unbearable, if you're just feeling like I'm on the edge and I can't, I can't see my way back, if you've got financial needs, which looking at the world around us right now, there's a fair amount of us out there. If you have financial needs and you're going, I don't know how I'm going to pay the bills. I want you to do something, not quite yet, because now I've laid it out and for some of you, you're going, yeah, that's me. If that's you, I want you to be vulnerable today. Spend some vulnerability on this room and I want you to raise your hand and let us know that it's you. Don't raise your hand quite yet because there's a, a little bit of a contract that I'm going to establish here. For the people that raise their hand, they are spending some vulnerability on the rest of us. And our job is to be vulnerable and go lay hands and pray for them. I think so many times we make this complicated. Like, if I pray, I need to say a Bible verse, and I got to, you know, like, make sure everything's theologically locked down and pray in Old English or something weird like that. You don't need to do any of that. You don't need to do any of that. You're talking to God on behalf of somebody else and just let it be that. So I want you to ask them, hey, how can I pray for you? And I want a few of you to pray out loud. I know it's scary for some of you to pray out loud for healing, pray out loud for God's provision. And I challenge you to well up with some compassion and spend some time. And we're gonna spend a few, few minutes praying. But if you are going through something really difficult, those of you that I was just talking about, would you be bold and just raise your hand right now? Anybody that's going through something? Okay, great. Come on, I know there's more of you. You're like, if you feel that burning, like the Lord's saying, that's the Lord, yeah. Okay, I want you to keep your hands up boldly. Thank you, that's awesome. And the, everybody that's around the people with their hands up, and if you see a concentration of them, maybe walk across the room. And I want you to lay hands on these people, and I want you to pray for them. Because this is the church right? We don't show up with burdens. We don't show up with our burdens to church, leave them on the inside, and then go home. That is not what we're called to do. So if, if you see somebody with their hands raised, go ahead right now. Let's lay hands on them. We're going to spend a few minutes just praying. Just everybody go ahead and pray.